Today we're going to be learning Yoma Daf Tetvav. We were in the middle of a section. We started talking about the Kohen Gadol is supposed to get ready for the big day where he has to do all the Avodot of the day and he's not necessarily used to that, so he practices the whole week. To which we had some questions. How can he do that if he has the Paraduma waters on him? Discussed, right, the different ideas about, the different opinions about whether that actually makes him impure or not. Anyway, that's a whole separate question about someone who's tahor, you sprinkle the, the waters on, does it make them tame? We figured out a way to explain it, even according to the other interpretation. Then we started talking about the order. And first we brought a Mishnah in Masechet Tamid, and we said, hey, the order in Masechet Tamid doesn't, I'm sorry, uh, in Masechet Tamid seems to be the opposite of by us. The Gemara said, oh, that's Rabbi Shimon Isha Mitzvah, don't worry about that. To which the Gemara said, what do you mean that's Rabbi Shimon Isha Mitzvah? We know you can't say all of Masechet Tamid was his tradition because we have a certain Mishnah there, which we're going to get back to, where today, where he says exactly, or not exactly the opposite, but very, he says a different approach than the Mishnah Masechet Tamid. So in other words, they brought the Mishnah Masechet Tamid and they brought his approach, which was a different approach to how you sprinkle the blood of the Korban Tamid, to which they said, okay, fine, so let's reverse it. Rabbi Yochanan said, fine, Yoma must be Rabbi Shimon Isha Mitzpah, and our Mishnah, uh, sorry, and that's our Mishnah, and Tamid is not according to his approach. <coughs> to wit, the Gemara said, but wait, it's not just that in Masechet Tamid we have a contradiction, but even in Masechet Yoma we seem to have a contradiction. In Masechet Yoma, on Daf Kape, and I brought it on the sheet, in the top of the sheet I charted them out, our Mishnah says, Kol Shivat Yamim, Huz Oreket Adat, Umaktir Etaktoret, Umetiv Etanerot. He sprinkles the blood, he does the incense, and he cleans out the, the candelabra. Now, if that's the case, it sounds like Torah comes first. The Mishnah in Yoma in Daf Kapei, and then also in Daf Kapav, says when they did the pais, the lottery, who gets which, which job, the second lottery included who does the candles, and the third lottery included who does the incense. So if that's the case, it sounds like the candles come before the incense. And that's a contradiction if we're going to say all the Masechet Yoma is one approach versus Masechet Tamid, which is a different approach. Now you have a problem with Masechet Yoma, to which Abayi said, oh, don't worry. Our Mishnah was taught, it's all a matter of your perspective. The Hatavad wrote, we now learned, they did in two, two um, the, the Hebrew word Nagalot, right? But two times, there was first or two uh, different, at two different times. First, they did five candles. Then they cleaned out the other two. And in between, they did something else. So then there's a whole debate what they did in between. According to Abba Shaul, they did the sprinkling of the blood in between. According to, um, according to the rabbis, they did the Torah in between. So if you hold like the rabbis that they did the Torah in between, then it's perfect. And we just say it's all a matter of your perspective. The first Mishnah where it said, first you do the Torah, then the candles was talking about the last two. And the Mishnah in Yoma where it said, later in Yoma where it said, first you do the candles was the first five candles that come before the incense. And they said that was Abaye's answer. To which they said, but Abaye, you taught everything according to Abba Shaul, who says it's not the Torah, it's the blood in the middle. And if the blood came in between the five and the two candles, then what happened after? After the Torah came, not in between. To which he simply answered, well, there's Abishal's approach that Abai brought, but Abai also now was talking according to the rabbis. Now, he was mentioning everyone's approach in different contexts. So that works. Um, now we're going to start with um, the bottom of the daf. So the bottom of yesterday's daf was talking about Abishal Omer. So now we get into Abishal and the rabbis. And what's his reason? Because of this pasuk that we're going to look at. Look at the order. The order says, first we do the candles, then we do the ketoret. That's Abba Shaul's approach. And that's why he claims that in between the five and the two was the sprinkling of the blood. And the, the candles came, uh, the ketoret came after. So now the rabbis say, so what do the rabbis say? He says, the rabbis say, what's the reason for this situation? 
it's what's the reason for the pasuk? How do you understand this pasuk according to the rabbis? Because in the Abishal says the Torah came after, but the but the rabbis say it didn't. So how do you read the pasuk? So it says be'idan hatava tehem miktar Torah. What it means to say is okay. Now let's read the pasuk again. The pasuk says um, which sounds like when you clean out the candles, then you do the k'tor. That's the way we first understood it. The rabbis who don't think that that's the case have the opposite order. The Torah comes first. What would they say? Again, first means in between the five and the two. Okay. Some ask, why don't they just say very simply? It depends on your perspective, but that's not what they're going to answer. So they say, when you do the lighting, the cleaning out of the candles, to hey miktar ktoret. The ktoret should be smoking up, which means how are you going to have the ktoret smoking up when you do the, when, it, when you do this? How's that going to work? Oh, it's going to work because you're going to do the ktoret first. And then after you do the ktoret, while it's smoking, that's when you do the candles. So when it says, and even if you read the whole verse, it actually makes sense. Because if you look at the Pasuk, it says, the subject of that Pasuk is the incense. It says, He's going to offer the incense. That means we want the incense to be smoking up while the candles, while you do the cleaning of the candles. If you want that to be, obviously, you can't do the incense after, you have to do it before. So that's how the rabbis understand that pasuk. Okay, so now, the rabbis are going to now prove how they know that their reading is correct. Obviously, Abishal didn't agree with this, and we're going to have to say, what does Abishal say? But they're going to prove it from another verse. That's a, The verse that we read is Shmot, chapter 30, pasuk 7, Zion. Now we're going to read the next pasuk. The next pasuk I'll read before we read it inside. And when Aaron would light the candles, which he would do in the evening, by the way, some people say is an interesting approach of the Rambam. They, they, they say the Rambam me, explains that you actually would light the candles also in the morning, which is a unique approach. The included lighting the candles, but we'll put that opinion aside, but just so you should know um, that it exists. But most people think means cleaning out in the morning, and then in the evening you would light them. So it says here, When you would light the candles in the, in the evening, which means late afternoon, you would also offer incense. Now, it sounds like if you're going to go, like, like Abishal said, what are you going to say? In the evening, what did they do? They lit the candles and then they offered incense. The rabbis tried to say, no, no, no. Every time it says, it means the smoke should be smoking up of the incense before, right, while you're doing the candles, which means you have to actually do it before. So now the rabbis are going to prove that it's 100% clear to them that this pasuk means you do the incense before. And even Abishal is going to have to agree with that. He's just going to have to say there's a difference between the two verses. But now we're going to say, if you don't say that yaktirena means it's going to be already done before and not that we're doing it after, then, in the afternoon, when it describes it, you'd have to say, he's basically saying to Abishal, if you say the order, Yaktirena means it's done after, then you'd have to say in the next pasuk, it also means it's done after. And that's definitely wrong. And we're going to see that right now. If you want to say that that's the order, there and it's also the order here, it can't possibly be. Why? The Hatani is it says in the following brighter. We're now going to bring a different verse. We're now jumping back three chapters in Shmot. We're going to chapter 27, verse 21, and we're going to talk about another verse that talks about Aaron and the candles. Where do you do this in all Moed outside the parochet? This is saying where the menorah is. Aaron, Ya'arochoto, that means he will light it, he and his sons, me'erev ad boke, from evening till morning. So there's more of the Pasuk, but we'll stop here. We're going to have two drashot on Erev ad boke. 
The first one doesn't help us, but we're quoting the whole Brighta, which includes the two. The second one is relevant to our purposes. Me'erevat boker. So the first explanation of what does it mean, me'erevat boker, right? You don't light candles from evening till morning. You don't stand there lighting them the whole time. So what does it mean, me'erevat boker? This is probably what you would have thought. Put enough in there so that it stays lit from the evening till the morning. This is something we say about Hanukkah candles also. It says you're supposed to light candles from the time the sun sets until the last people come back from the shul. So some people explain that to me. And there was one answer in the Gemara that what does it mean? It's not just the time that you're supposed to do the mitzvah. It's how much oil you need to put in that needs to last that whole time. That's why all candles are half an hour, because most people define that time as being half an hour. There's other interesting things about that, which we talked about in Masechet Shabbat when we learned that sugya. But being, getting back to our topic, me'erva boker means how much oil you're supposed to put in. Davar achel, a different interpretation, and this is what's relevant to our purposes. Me'erva boker, ein lecha avodah shekshera me'erva boker ela zo bilvad. There's no such thing that one can do from evening till morning, accept this activity, meaning this is the very last thing done in the temple. If this is the very last thing done in the temple, clearly when it says, yaktirena, after the words, or no, sorry, it says, um, right, ba'alot aron etanerot ben arbaim yaktirena. Yaktirena can't mean after because nothing is done after. And even Abishawal has to agree with that because everybody agrees with that. So if that's the case, so what does the Pasuk mean in that second verse in, in chapter 30 of Shemot? It must mean that the Ketoret has to be burning while you do the candles, which means then we may as well say that if Yaktirena in that verse means it's done before and just has to be smoking up during the cleaning of the, during the lighting of the candles, then we should say the same thing is true for the previous section and the previous verse. That when it says it in the morning, it's the same thing. The Torah has to be there first so that when you clean the candles, the incense is burning. Now, obviously you'd say only the last two candles because no one thinks that the Torah's done before the first five, but we're ignoring that element for right now. It's not important for our purposes right now. Now, how's Abishal going to explain that then? If this seems like a pretty good proof, yaktirena, yaktirena, it's the same wording. It appears right after the nero. For sure, even Abishal has to agree that in the afternoon it's done that way. So why doesn't he think in the morning it's done that way? So Abishal, Amar Lecha, he would say to you, he's not here to answer for himself, but this is how he would explain that pasuk. Shanehatam dechtiv oto. When it talks about the candles, and this is the verse we quoted in chapter 27, it says, oto This should be the last thing that Aaron and his sons do, meaning nothing comes after this. But it says, oto, this. So they like, right, this one. It's kind of pinpointing, specifically the afternoon. So it comes up a shower and he says, that shows you that the afternoon is done differently than the morning. Okay, so this is a way of saying the afternoon has its own unique laws, which means that when it says yaktirena there, it means the Torah should be burning before you finish the cleaning, you know, the lighting of the candles, before you light the candles. But in the morning, the Torah should be done after. And that's how he resolves it. He says that's just unique, and we can explain each pasuk according to its own place. Again, this was all a tangent we got off on when we talked about Abaye giving this answer of splitting between the two and the five, to which we said, right, and then the Torah comes in the middle, to which we said, but he says in the name of Abba Shaul, and I mentioned we say this in Davening in the Karbanot section, that he quotes the name of Abba Shaul, that we don't do the Torah in the middle, we do the Torah after, in which then we just got off on this whole tangent and we said, oh, there's a machloket about Abba Shaul and the rabbis. Abai in our answer is referring to the rabbi's tradition and not Abba Shaul's tradition. And there, when he gave the, the explanation of how we do the avoda, he was saying, and he even said it, in the name of Abba Shaul. So that doesn't bother. But now that the Gemara had, and then the Gemara went into explaining what's the rabbis in Abishaul, now we have a much simpler answer to our question. If we have this contradiction, why don't we just simply say, and that's what Rav Papa is going to say, Rav Papa Amal, lo kasha, ha-rabanan, ha-abishaul. Oh, there's a better answer. 
We have a difference in the order. Well, that was exactly the Machlok at Abishal and the rabbis. So why don't we just say our Mishnah follows, right? Our Mishnah said first the Ketorah, then the candles. That's the rabbis. And the other Mishnah that we quoted on Kafe and Kafav, where it said first, right, the pious, the first, the second pious was the candles, and the third was the Ketorah. That goes according to um, Abishal. Okay, so our Mishnah is the rabbis, that Mishnah is Abishal. Why don't we just say that? So that's a good answer, right? So he says, but now we're going to have a bit of a problem. I just want to respond to, right, I think if I saw from the chat correctly, there was this question about why we split the two and the five. And I, I said yesterday, we're going to get to that when we'll, we'll see that sugya itself in its own place. Here, it's a little bit secondary to the whole sugya, so I'm not going to get into it now. We'll get into it later. I think it's Daflam and Gimel. So now Rav Papa says, that's the, that's the distinction. But now they have a question. So now, right, according to what we just said, our Mishnah is the rabbis. The Mishnah in Kafe Kavav is Abba Shaul. We're going to raise a problem with that. Why? Well, look past that Mishnah. Look on Daf Lamed Aleph. There's another Mishnah. So if we're already saying the beginning of the Masechet, right? Okay, we could say, even though we, we said before, we kind of thought one goes according to one tradition, one goes according to another, but maybe even within the Masechet, we could split a little bit. We could say the beginning of the Mishnah was said according to one opinion and the later part said according to another. But now look at the continuation of the Mishnah. What else does it say? Now here we get into a problem with the Kohen Gadol. He's supposed to do on Yom Kippur. We're already now into Yom Kippur, right? The Armish is just pre-Yom Kippur, things the Kohen Gadol is supposed to do in preparation. But now we're really getting into Yom Kippur itself in the Mishnayot and Kafe, Kavav, and then, right, they start talking about the Payasot, and then they're going to get into the Kohen Gadol. If he's supposed to do all the work, sometimes there's a bit of an issue, like when it comes to Shechita, one of the avodot you do is slaughtering. Then you also have to catch the blood. Now you can't possibly slaughter an animal and catch the blood at the same time. It's not possible, not physically possible. So how do we do, deal with that? So the Mishnah tells us, Okay, so safer usually means the end of that Mishnah, but it also sometimes means, you know, in that area, in that section, go a little farther. And you'll see another mission, which doesn't seem to work with what you just said. Hey, So they bring, here we're at, we're at Yom Kippur. We bring him the Korban Tamid. That's the first thing they did in the morning, right? The first uh, sacrifice of the day. Chatzo. So he starts to slaughter it. He makes a nick in the neck. He doesn't finish the slaughtering. He starts. Umerak acher yado. Someone else now comes in and finishes the shrita. He doesn't do the whole shrita because otherwise he wouldn't be able to collect the blood. So he starts the shrita process. Someone else comes in in his place. This isn't really relevant for our purposes, but it's just interesting and we'll get to it later. Then, in other words, it doesn't even say, but he then catches the blood, right? And then he goes to get the, to do the ktoret. Now again, notice the order. We're switched back right now. Okay, we're switched to, switched to the, uh, you know, the order that it says in the beginning of the Masechet, right? So now it's really confusing. We start off with Ketorit Neirot, then we go to Neirot Ketorit, and then we go to Ketorit Neirot again. And if you're going to say that was the rabbis, this is Abba Shaul, you know, the, the cafe one, and then we're going to go back to the rabbis, it seems like a very big ping pong here. Okay, in terms of the, I see some, Caroline, you're writing about the cruelty to the animal. I assume someone was right there. He just starts a little and then someone, you know, right there is finishing it up. I don't think it makes so much of a difference in terms of timing, at least it seems to me. So now, so again, they're going to say, Atam the Rabbanan, right? So that Mishnah in Lamed Aleph is the rabbi's approach, where the Ketorah comes before the candles. Reish of Sefer Rabbanan, Mitziata Abba Shaul. Doesn't make sense that we're going to ping pong, you know, we're going to go back and forth. Rabbis, Abishal, rabbis, seems very odd. To which Rav Papa says, Amar Lecha Rav Papa, in, I don't have a problem with it. In means yes in Aramaic. Yes. Reish of Sefer Rabbanan, Mitziata Abishal. The first Mishnah and the last Mishnah, right, meaning of this, the ones that we're discussing, are both the rabbis. And in the middle, we have Abishal's approach. It happens not so crazy. So now we're going to go back to Abaye and say, well, now we get why Abaye didn't hold like Rav Papa. In other words, even though it seemed like a very easy solution, this Abba Shaul Rabbanan distinction would have been a good answer, but now we understand why Abaye didn't do that. So Bishlama Abaye, Loamaka Rav Papa. 
Abai didn't want to have this ping pong saying, Reish of a Sefer Rabbanan Abishal. And that's why he distinguished five candles, two candles, because it made more sense to him than to start distinguishing and have one Mishnah go like the rabbis, the next Mishnah go like Abishal, and the next Mishnah like the rabbis. That seemed weird to him. And therefore, lo mokim lay, right? He didn't want to do reish of a sefer rabbanan umitziyat abisham. Ella, Papa, my time alone, Omar Kabai. But why didn't Rav Papa hold like Abai, the five and the two? Amar lacha. So he would answer again. Rav Papa's not here to tell us why he didn't hold like Abai, but we can only conjecture. What did he think? Tana bereisha hatavat shtei nerot vahader hatavat chamesh nerot. Again, it wouldn't make sense if you're referring to the fixing of the candles, the cleaning out of them. So in one case, you'd say is the first five. And in another case, you'd say it's the second, it's the last two. That also doesn't make sense. If it says it must mean the same thing in each place. And that's why you didn't want to hold like a buy. So what would a buy say to that? Abai says, let's look at the Mishnayot in order and what their purpose is. The purpose of the first Mishnah, which again, he says is talking about the first two candles. I'm sorry, the last two candles. The purpose of the first Mishnah was really just to teach you, to teach the Kohen Gadol, right? Teach you what the Kohen Gadol had to learn that week. It didn't so much, and this is something I suggested in the beginning, didn't so much, it wasn't so much there to tell you the order of events. However, when it comes to the later Mishnah, they want to tell you the order of events. And then, the problem is there's a ping pong, right? First, it's referring to, it, it has it in a different order. And again, Abai will have to say five and then two, right? Or two and then five. So basically what we're going to say is, right? It's first five and Kapei, it's talking about the, the, the first five. And in the second case, it's talking about the last two. So then he says, well, there it makes sense because Sidra HaHadar Tanele. Later, it's going into the order. So first it mentions the first candles, right? Because you do the pies for the first candles and then the Ketoret. And then, it says, and then the Kohen is going to go like Tirk Torah and to do the candles, and there it's referring to the last two. So there it goes a little bit more in an order. Again, there's a lot of questions to this answer. It's not the perfect answer, but that's how he tries to resolve it and say, again, it's the Gemara trying to put words in Tabai's mouth. Why Bai doesn't really have a problem with that. Now we finish with that section. We're now going to move back to the Mishnah that I mentioned in Masechet Tamid, which, which then we saw Rabbi Shimon Isha Mitzpah, a different way of doing it. We're now talking about the sprinkling of the blood of the Korban Tamid. If you have your map that I suggest that people get, it'll help you just to see things. I'm going to bring pictures also. That map, which kind of gives you the perspective of the whole room is also very helpful. But these pictures that I'll pull up on the screen are, are definitely going to be very helpful. So here we have the Kohen. Let's just pull them up. Um, he's being slow. I don't know why. Um, okay, so let's start reading. Ba'lo lekeren mizrachit tzfonit. Okay, the Kohen Gadol now comes into the room. Okay, he comes into the, let's find the picture that shows this. He comes in. Okay, so if you have your, your big map also, you can see a little bit better where he's coming in and what, what he's doing. So the Kohen Gadol comes in. He goes up the ramp. Now, when you go up this ramp, okay, you can see from the map, this says Darom. This is south. So he's on the south side. He goes up the ramp and he's walking toward the north side, okay? On his right is the east side. So what does he do? Notemo So he gets up, he starts walking to the right. Now we're gonna see later, the Gemara is gonna say that he always walks to the right, but we don't yet know this, but anyway, let's just assume we know right now. He makes a right-hand turn when he gets up that ramp. So he makes a right-hand turn and goes, the first corner he gets to, since he's on the south side of the room, is the southeastern wall because he's going to the right and to the right of him is the east side, which is again, the entrance way, not the, the west is toward the, the hecha, the sanctuary. Remember, we're in the big outer Mizbeach, which is outside the sanctuary. It's in between, right? The entrance to the Azara and the sanctuary. So he gets there. Now, where does he go? He goes first, he doesn't stop at that first corner, which later we're gonna ask why he doesn't stop there but he goes on to the next corner. So he passes the first corner without doing anything. And then he gets to the next corner, which if he's going to the right and walking in a, in a counterclockwise direction, which is the way he's walking, then he's gonna get to the northeastern side. When he gets there, what does he do? Here's our next picture. The bottom of this picture, you can see 
he puts the blood, notain mizrachit sponi. He puts the blood at the bottom. We'll get to this bottom thing later. All the korbanot ola, the blood went on the bottom part of the mizbech. If you see here this picture, there's a chutasikha in the middle of the altar, the middle of the height. There was a red line that went all around to distinguish the top from the bottom, because we're going to learn that the chatats, the blood was sprinkled at the top of the altar on the corners at the top. And the ola, the burnt offerings, were sprinkled at the bottom, at the base of the altar. So he puts on that corner, so you can see from this picture, that he puts it on the corner so that you get to both sides. This is what we call in general, it comes up in, in the Mishnah, in Zvachim. Uh, also, we say it in our davening in the morning, in Korbano. It's called Shtayim Shehem Arv, which is you're going to do two corners, and with those, you're going to stand at two different corners, not at all four. And you're going to do two puddings of the blood, but you're going to get to all four corners because you're going to put it right on the corner, as you see very nicely in this picture, if you have it in front of you. Okay, if you're not watching the video, all the pictures are on the site, on today's post, and you can just look there or on the details of the podcast, it should be there also. So now he gets there, he puts on that corner. Maravitro meat, he now goes two more corners, right? He goes from that corner, he moves to the north west, and then from there to the southwest. When he gets to the southwest corner, which is the final corner before he gets back to the ramp, he does another nitina just like this. Now there's a brighta on this that says, and we saw this all yesterday, he has a different version. So far the same. When he gets though to the opposite corner, what does he do? He puts first on the west side, then on the south side. So now we have, instead of saying, now in, if you know in Masechet Zvachim, okay, I'll explain to you, if you didn't, never learned it, there's either, usually, is one possibility. There's a few possibilities, but usually it's either two that are four, if, you're, if they're going on all four. Okay, In some cases, they don't go on all four, but that's not our issue. Or... Arba shein arba, which means four times, right? You go to each corner and you put the blood on each corner. So here we have something strange. We have shalosh shein arba, because you have three placings of the blood, which gets to four corners. That's a very odd one. Both logically, it seems strange, and there's no real precedent for it, which we're going to get to several questions against Rabbi Shimon's approach. We're going to have six questions. So first they want to know, my time at the Rabbi Shimon Isha Mitzvah, where does he get this from? So the answer is, Rabbi Yochanan, Mishum Chad de Rabbi Yanai. Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of someone from the house of Rabbi Yanai, Amalcha, the Pasuk says, Usi'ir izim echad l'chatat, ala Hashem, alo latatamid yaseven isko. This is in the context, totally different context. This is in the context of the Korban Chatat that we do. Now, um, one sec, just looking at questions. I see, okay, I'm going to stop for a minute and look at some questions. I see. There's some questions about logistics. How does he get to the top, to the bottom? So first of all, he goes down the ramp. And when he's at the top and then he needs to go to the bottom, he just goes down the ramp. That's pretty easy. If he has to do on both, it's a little bit strange, but he doesn't have to do on both. Right now, right? Different sacrifices have different placements where you're supposed to place the blood. So either you're standing at the top and putting it on the top, or you're standing at the bottom and putting it at the bottom, okay? Um, sometimes we'll see maybe he was standing in the middle. There's the sauvé. That's also another possibility that comes up, I think, with the bird offerings, if I remember correctly. But usually he's either standing at the top or he's standing on the ground next to the altar. And that's when he does the, the blood. Okay, I hope that answered your question. If not, you can ask me further. Um, and he basically walks up and down the ramp. That's how they get up and down. That's what the ramp was for. It was pretty high. So they used the ramp to get up and down. And the part of the ramp there was a, the ramp went down, but there was also part of the ramp that came out and got you to the middle of the height of the altar. That was another possibility. Um, I just want to look, I see, one second. Now I realize what your question is, because I think, second, he was standing, right, he was standing in the middle. You're right, my mistake. He doesn't stand at the top, he's standing in the middle here. That's what I, okay. So that's what I, so here he's standing in the middle. When the ramp, okay, we don't have the picture here, but you can see, okay, if you look, if you have this map, Okay, here, I'll, I'll stop sharing and I'll show you at least in my picture. I don't have, but we'll see pictures later about this. If you see the ramp has one line on this side and two lines on that side, it's very hard to see in the picture. 
but on one side of the ramp, okay, it's the side that's closer to the hechal. There's a there's two lines there because it went up and down, and there was a ramp that basically got you. It was like another ramp that came off of this ramp that got you to the middle of the height of the altar. Now I see what you're asking. That's the answer to your question. Okay, so now let's get back to our 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 subject. So we want to know what does he do? What does he do with this verse? It says, this is in Pinchas, Parsha Pinchas, where we have the sacrifices of Rosh Chodesh. And it says right there, it gives all the sacrifice of all the holidays and Rosh Chodesh included. It says you're supposed to bring a Se'irizim Echad Lechata, okay? A Se'irizim for a sin offering. And then it says, Lachata Lahashem, okay? It's a Chatat, sin offering for God. Al Olat HaTamid Yaseven Nisko. That means, what it really means is the simple reading is, in addition, you bring this in addition to the everyday sacrifice that you bring, which is a burnt offering. But often it says in these psukim, milvad olata tamid, which means in addition, right? That that happens and this also happens. But this one says al olata tamid. So he darshans this in a particular way. What does he say? He says, really, even though the subject is the chatat, he says that there's another thing going on here and it's telling you about the everyday tamid sacrifice. Olahi, it's talking about the Ola, and it says, now it says, the Chatat should be on the Ola Tatamid. The way he reads that is, we're going to take laws of the Chatat and place them upon the Ola, the everyday Tamid offering, which means, how do you do that? What does it mean to take things you do for the Chatat and do it to the Ola, the specific Ola of the Tamid? We now learn that this is what we call a compromise approach. What we're doing is we're doing this korban ola of the damatamid partially like an ola, which is normally shtayin chain arba, and partially like a chatat, which is arba chain arba. So the first half we do like the ola, which is instead of shtayin chain arba, it's only going to be one, which is two. And then when you get to the second half, the other two, you're going to do it like the chatat, which is Stein shem stein, basically, which is half of arba shem arba, right? Four that are four. Instead of that, we're only doing half like the chata. So we're doing two that are two. So that's how you end up with three. It's this in between. So we're going to do the first half of the sprinkling like the ola and the second half like the chata. That's what he learns from this verse. So now we're going to have six questions against this. Okay, here goes. Why come up with this compromise? If we want to do it like the Ola and like the Chata, why don't we have him go around twice? Do, or twice this way, right? Do one walking around Stein Chain Arba twice on two corners, which end up being four. And then do it again, four that are four, and go, right, like the Chata is done. So they say, okay. That we don't do because we don't have a precedent for anything like that. We don't have anywhere where you do two placements of the blood, two rounds. No. So now the Gemara says, what do you mean we don't have a precedent for it? If we don't have a precedent for it, that's why you're not doing it. This is a question on the answer here. We don't have a precedent for this either, that we do three, half like the Ola, half like the Chata. We don't have any precedent for that either. If already you're going to say the Pasuk did something out of the ordinary, you know, made this different, well, why don't you just say it made it out of the ordinary and we're going to do two rounds once you're, once you're doing it. So they say, no, it's different. There's not, it's not the same thing to say do two rounds as it is to say split it 50-50. Right? That's already less of a change from the norm. So that's why it makes more sense to go with this approach. And that's why we don't do two rounds. That's question number one. Question number two. Okay, now we'll pull up the pictures again. Now we get back to this picture that we saw before, which really we weren't, we really didn't need to look at before. Now it's important for our purpose. This picture shows that we're going to basically take this, the dam chatat, as I said, you stand, and I said it before you stand at the top, you don't. You stand in the middle and you put the blood at the top. The dam ola, you stand at the bottom and you put it, notice there's this, this piece that comes out, that juts out. This is called the yesod. You, we're going to get back to it later today, so pay attention to it. Notice it's not on all sides, okay? It's only on two sides. Okay, we're going to get to that. It's on the west side and on the north side of the altar. 
So you stand by the base there where you have this you so jutting out one ama, and you stand next to it and you put the blood there for burnt offerings. So now they're saying basically, if we're doing the first the first two, right, which is one that's two, we're doing that like an ola. And the second two, we're doing like a hatat. Why don't we make the kohen? Start with the ola at the bottom, do the first one at the bottom, and then move to the middle of the altar and put it at the top of the altar. The second two, right, should be placed at the top, like the chatat. So that's their question. If we really want to do one like the ola and one like the chatat or two, right, whatever, we, however you want to number them, but we should just switch for, he should move from the bottom to the top. So the answer, again, we don't have a precedent for this. So now the Gemara says, really, we don't, huh? I'll show you a precedent. Velo. Now, don't we know, there's a Mishnah, and it's in Yoma also, which says, and you all know this from the davening on Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol in Yom Kippurim goes into the Kodesh Kodeshim, and he starts sprinkling the blood. We say, achat, achat biachat, achat b'shtayim in our davening, right? So what does he do? He does one up above and then seven down below. So obviously when it comes to the kaporet, he does some above, some below. So what do you mean we never split the sprinklings? Here we have a split of the sprinklings, some are higher, some are lower. So the answer, no, ke matzlif. He does this like a matzlif. We don't yet know what a matzlif is, neither does the gemar. Gemar asks, my matzlif, what's a matzlif? So Machabe Rabbi Yehudi showed kim and It's like someone who takes a whip and beats someone. Now when they do lashes, they would hit someone. Now there's a few different interpretations, but we'll go with one that he would basically, they would use the lashes, whip someone, then go lower, 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 lower. In other words, they would go down a little bit so that they don't whip someone in the same place over and over. So if that's the case, right? Some people say like the, la the a whip, you know, kind of veers downward, but whatever, however you explain it, it means that it wasn't done one on the higher part of the kaporet and one on the, and seven on the lower part. No, it was done each one a little bit lower than the previous. It doesn't mean that some were above, some were below. So that's not a, that's not a good proof. Then they say, we'll bring another proof against. Now the Kohen Gadol comes out of the Kodesh Kodeshim and then he goes to the inner altar. And when he goes to this inner altar, okay, this is the Dama Zahab, the Mizbech Zahab. He takes the blood also, and we're going to get to all of these later. And he sprinkles it on the Taharosh Shamizbeh. So now I'm showing you this picture, but don't really look at all the details of the picture yet, because first they're going to suggest some other way, and what you see is the answer. Now, what does it mean, Taharosh Shamizbeh Shevapamim? They assume Taharosh, my love, Apalge de Mizbeh. They assume it means mid height of the altar. Now, if you start sprinkling blood on the mid height of the altar, you, you're not going to be exact. Some of it's going to go above and some of it's going to go below. So here again, we have an a, a case where they did some above and some below. And then, how do we know that it means the middle of the altar? Kedam reina tar tira. Tar tira means the sun got to the middle of the sky, it's afternoon. Now, if that's the case, what is afternoon exactly in the middle? That means they assume it means he put it in the middle of the height of the altar. To which the Gemara says, right, and that's hu palgadiyoma, that's half a day. So tiara must mean half, meaning half the height of the altar. But Amar Baba Shila, he says, no, 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 you're wrong. It's not talking about that. It's talking about the top of the altar. And that's what you see in this picture. He would put the blood on the opening revealed part of the altar. And we're going to see, which means it was clear like, like day, like the sun was in the middle of the sky. Toar here means as clear as possible, noticeable to everyone. And then on the top, that's the part that's revealed to everybody. And therefore it means the top of the altar, which means that this has nothing to do with blood being put higher and lower, in which case we're back to concluding there is no such precedent for blood being put higher and lower on the altar, and we resolve that question. So now we're up to question number three. Why the order? First do it like the Ola, then do it like the Chatat. Why don't you do the reverse? So the answer, what do you mean? This whole thing is a burnt offering. So of course, we're going to start treating it like a burnt offering. And then the second part will be like the sin offering. That was an easy one. Okay, now they're going to start off. And it's going to be a little confusing with the direction. So again, the picture will be very helpful. They're going to say, Okay, 
Okay, it sounds very confusing. But what it really means is a very simple question. We put, what we did is basically, he goes up the ramp on the south side. He makes a right, he passes by that first corner and goes to the second. Then he passes the third, right? I feel like I'm uh, in a baseball game, right? He passes second base, he goes to third base. Okay, that's the best way to envision this. So now, why doesn't he do first and third and not second and fourth, right? Why, why skip the first one? It doesn't make so much sense. So, right, they basically are saying, why don't you start with one, why don't you do one and three? To which the Gemara answers, Amre Ola to Una Yisod. Now, as I showed you before, the Yisod is that extra part. And Korban Ola has to be spilled the blood where there's a base. Now, there's no base on this side. On that first corner of the Dromit Mizrahi, there's no base because there's no base on the southern side and there's no base on the, west, on the eastern side. So there's no base of the altar there. That's why you didn't sprinkle the blood there. Now they ask another question. So I think what they don't like here is why skip over something, right? You, you, you want to always do the mitzvah right away. So why, if you want to make sure there's a yes, so we understand. So you have to skip the first one, but we have a better solution. Start going up that ramp and instead of making a right, make a left. When you get to the left, where are you going to be? On the southwest side. On the west side, there's a yesod, a the whole strip. So right there, there's a yesod. So, and that's where we end up doing it. So why don't you just, now they say, why don't you start, right? Why don't you go first to the southwest? Go left. And then go around and get eventually to the other one. So the answer is, and this is what I told you before, here's your picture. When you go up the ramp, you always have to go to the right. Whenever you go anywhere, you have to go right. This is in the Mikdash. You have to turn right and to the east. Okay, that's the way you do it. And therefore, and that's why he gets to that corner first, because if you have to always turn right, this is a matter of right being important, significance, we always go to the right, and then you're going to basically go in a counterclockwise direction. Okay, we're now up to the, our last sixth question. Why? The Pasuk says the chatat al olata tamid, right? Which we explain to be put the laws of the chatat onto the ola. But really, you could have said, Chatat should be done like the Ola and not the Ola should be done like the Chatat. So why did you read it that way? So they say, Los al it doesn't make sense to read it that way. Because it says, on the Olata Tamid, how do we understand this? My Kamarachman, what the Torah say? Midi de Chatat Shadea Ola. And this is how I explained it originally, which is whatever it says for the Chatat should be put onto the Ola. In other words, that's how you read that verse. Okay, so there we had, again, this was all to explain this other Misha that we mentioned previously about Rabbi Shimon Isha Mitzvah and how he gets to this weird approach. And then the Gemara asked six questions on it to which we came up with answers for all of it. Now we're going to end with a contradiction between a bright a Mishnah in Mesechet Amin and a Mishnah in Mesechet Midot that describe this place called the Lishkat HaTzlaim. Okay, you can see this picture. There, there were all the animals there for the Korban Tamid. That's where they would keep the lambs. And it was called the Lishkat Tzleim. It was in this room called the Beta Moked. There's some pictures. The Beta Moked was this fire that would always be going in the Beta Moked. Okay, and here's the room. Here's like a bird's eye view of the room. We have a few different pictures of it. And if you see, it's on your map. Okay, if you look on your map, it's in the, if you have the map, it's in the Azara. Okay, and it's kind of parallel near the, the Ulam, which was the entranceway into the sanctuary right below that. Okay, and you can see it's on the border here. This is what's important to know. If you see in the picture here, okay, there's Kodesh and Chol. Half the room was in the Kodesh and half of it was in the Chol because there's the boundary here. So half of it was considered in the Azara and half of it was out. There's all sorts of ramifications like can you eat sacrificial meat there, et cetera. So let's see our contradiction. The contradiction is basically going to be, is this room on the south? Is this, this, this um, section, is it on the north side or the south side? Now there's big relevance it's on the north side or the south side because it's either in the sanctity, the sanctified area, or it's not in the sanctified area. So here comes the mission. And if you can see from your picture, if you have a map and the picture here, they all put it on the south side, even though the first source we're, we're going to read puts it on the north side of the room. It's non-hatam. It says in Masechet Tamid, 
person, there was a person in charge of the temple and he would kind of announce things to people. Okay, it's time for this. So it's the morning and he says, okay, bring me the lamb that we need for the korban tamit. Bring it from the lishkata tleim. So then they say, It was in the northwestern corner of that room. Okay. There were four sections of that room. One was called the Lishkata Tleim. Remember, we had the Chotamot that people would buy these tokens to buy the, the Nisachim. That's where this fire was going. You can see the picture here in the, in the top left corner of the picture. And in one day we bake the lechem apanim. Uriminu, but that contradicts the source of Masechet in Mishnah Midot. Arba the shakot ayu lebed amoked ki kitoniot apetuchot letchaklin. Here we get a bit of a more description. They were like little vestibules that would open into the corridor. Shtayim bakodesh ushtayim bachol. Two would be on the sanctified side and two on the non-sanctified side. Berashe pas besim abdilim bekodesh bachol. There were little poles that would separate. You see the picture here. These little round things that basically made a border so that everybody knew where the border between the sanctified area and the non-sanctified area. Uma hayu show. what will we do in each of these rooms? We're only going to read the first one for today, but that's already our contradiction. Maravit romit talishkat le korban. So the maravit romit, now notice, right? It said in Masechet Tamid, it was on the south, the north, um, the northwestern side. This says it was in the southwestern side. So now we have a problem because each one describes it in a different place. This is always the problem, as I said, with maps, because maps can only show one picture, right? And one way of looking at it. But in fact, there's machlokot about this, and we'll see tomorrow about how they resolve it, and we'll finish reading the rest of that Mishnah, and then we'll get to their resolution. Okay, so with that, we will finish for today, and uh, have a good day, everyone.